One of the lessons learned by Finland in the Winter War was the requirement for additional air defense. In 1941, an order was placed to help fill a bit of the gap. Uh, this would become the IT PSV 41, uh, which is shorthand for something incredibly long. I have it in the title and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I mean, I, I had enough difficulty with the, uh, the Swedish names of, dear God, Finland, what's with your language? That aside, the vehicles were built in 1942. Now, the first one was built and armed in Sweden. The other five were armed in Finland, the befores of 40 millimeter being built by the state arms manufacturer. The vehicle itself, also known as the Anti-2, is based off of the Landsverk L62, which is basically a Landsverk L60, somewhat stretched. If you compare the videos that I did at Arsenal and with the M38 or M40, you'll see that the road wheel spacing is much longer on this. For six vehicles built, a surprising amount still exists because this thing stayed in Finnish service till 1966. This particular vehicle, well, I am located at the Finnish Armor Museum in Parola. And so, as ever, we're going to take the tour of the vehicle starting around the bottom which is going to be fairly L60-like, and then move to the turret. So uh, let's get started. So if you look at the front of the vehicle, well, officially the vehicle is up to two centimeters of armor, although this front slope here seems to be only 12, as best I can measure it. Uh, headlights, of course, on both sides. The towing hooks, those kind of curly warthog things that were on the Swedish vehicle. Well, the Finns have decided to go for something a little bit less uh, interesting. Uh, with just basic eyelets to which you could attach your shackles. The vehicle is generally welded. Uh, again, the Swedes were kind of ahead of the game on that. But you will, of course, notice for maintenance purposes all these bolts on the front. And yeah, they're pointed in order to reduce the impact of bullets, but they are very definitely six sided bolts. And uh, you can also see on the very top of the hull screws used instead of bolts. And in fact, it's a screw here and a bolt here. So quite what they did that, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, obviously, you've got some spare track link on the front left. Differential and steering is going to be behind this. And you're going to be able to see that, well, there's a, a little latch here. Um, you would have a little square key that you could use to open this up and you could uh, check the fluids without having to lift the entire front. Now, however, this is a running vehicle. In fact, everything in this room is a running vehicle and they have left the access port unbolted, which is convenient because that means I can lift this up and we can see the whole lot. And it's a, a simple enough uh, transmission and braking system. Actually, I'm going to inset a, a picture of one that they have dismounted on display elsewhere in the museum. Uh, brakes on either side, differential in the middle. You've got a bulge at the front here to add just a little bit more space. And of course, we have the access point for one of the fluids, which looks like you need a, uh, they've done this so tightly you need a screwdriver or something to open it up, which I do not happen to have with me. Uh, but that's your fluid check again through the little port up here. You can also see the thickness of the armor. Uh, the lip here is not part of the armor. It's just added on for the hatch to, to rest against. The actual thickness of the armor is the bit that's not on the lip. It's the, so the green, if it's not green, it's red here too. You know where I'm going. It's It's the same thickness as this, put it that way. And then we go around the side. In fact, I've got more room on this side. So for a change, I will go clockwise around the vehicle and not counterclockwise. When you come down to the running gear, well, I wish I could tell you what was particularly different and interesting from the Ironsburg L60s that we saw earlier, uh, but no, not really. The differences are just minor, minor details. Uh, as you're looking at the sprocket wheel, uh, you can see filler ports for the lubrication system. The uh, sprocket ring or the teeth ring are, is held on by uh, bolts, same one, the one on the inside. So when things do wear a little bit too much, 
Well, you pull off the wheel, you swap the rings around, and that way you start wearing the other side. Or actually, it'd probably be just as simple to swap the, swap the two sprocket wheels one side to the other. There's no difference inside. Now, I'm looking at the shape of these teeth, which, as you can see, are not symmetrical. And it, it makes you wonder, is it uh, designed this way? Or is it simply the case that after 20 something years of service, these have simply worn away? And uh, it'll be interesting, I'm gonna have to go back now and uh, I'll, I'll put an inset if I can of one of the L60 sprockets to see what their uh, teeth look like. Uh, but on a regular vehicle, the teeth are an easily replaceable part because they do wear, and there's often wear markers on them that let you know, okay, you've run this sprocket wheel enough, it's time to reverse it or replace it. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking at some very large gaps here and I'm wondering just how worn this wheel is. Now obviously getting replacements is a little bit difficult these days. As you move back, you'll see that the first set of road wheels, and this is all torsion bar suspension still, uh, the first set of road wheels seems to be on a shock. Uh, but not the rest, which just have uh, bump stops instead. Road wheels themselves, they are, they appear to be a single piece, as I'm looking, they seem to be. Uh, and so you would dismount or mount them together as one single piece. So as ordinarily you would find uh, center guide teeth, uh, road wheels are individually detachable in pairs. Uh, the Swedish ones, they seem to like making them as one big piece, which of course makes things doubly heavy, but doubly strong. A couple of return rollers. Uh, again, we have much bigger gap I'd mentioned before between the road wheels on the L60 and those on the uh, L62 or the Anti-2. Tow cables on each side, and the track is also held in place by the same cap system that we saw on the uh, L60s. So there's no cotter pins, there's no bolts or anything, it's just a little cap in there that uh, you hammer in place to put it in, and then you have to figure out how do you chisel this thing out again in, in, order, to, uh, in order to replace it. Well, actually what you don't do, you don't chisel it out, you, you use a track pin and you hammer uh, at one end or the other way, you can access it from both sides. So as I'm thinking about myself, I've corrected myself immediately. Uh, but yeah, sledgehammering with a, uh, with a pin should punch this out. Punch pin, that's the word, punch pin. So as we come back to the extended side of the vehicle, you can see not only compared to the L60 have they added an extra road wheel, but they've also increased the gap between the wheels as well. So this is a substantially larger vehicle than the M38 or M40 that we'd seen before, even before you take into account the sides of the turret. Finally, as you get to the idler at the back, uh, obviously it's where you'd adjust the track tension, you'll see that the ground clearance is only a few centimeters really, uh, 10 centimeters maybe between the ground and the idler. So as you would expect, the idler wheel does have a suspension capability as well, otherwise you'll end up with a couple of fairly solid knocks. Storage bin on the left-hand side, wired in place because they don't want people messing with it. And so we come around to the back, a little bit more storage for sledgehammers, fantastic. One thing I noticed about the, uh, the back plate on the engine deck is that on the right-hand side, the clamp holds down from the bottom, and on the left-hand side, it uh, holds down from the top. Uh, they say it makes it more secure because I did ask. Then of course you get to the back. So the muffler comes all the way across and out. We have a single tail light, which I presume was originally red and now faded to orange or something. Uh, tow hook with a locking pin. And let's see, this if I recall was the crank. There we go, it's the crank for the hand start. As you come around the left side of the vehicle, well, you have a slightly different open storage. Uh, actually, while I think about it, I'll just mention for clarity's sake on the idler, yes, it is where track tension is kept, but it is automatically done. Because it is on torsion bars, always pushing outwards, 
So there is considered to be limited need for the track tension to be set specifically. You can also see that there's a bump stop at the top and it shows you just the range of motion. You can have about yay big. Further forward, this is the storage point for the hand crank. And then you get again to the upper hull superstructure side on top of the tow cables. Now you see that the upper hull is sloped. It is sloped armor outwards. And it's done not so much for additional ballistic protection, although it doesn't, doesn't hurt, but actually to make the turret ring wider to give the lads inside a lot more space. And finally, storage for the uh, bore brush, or the, the staff, the cleaning staff. So let's have a look at the engine compartment. Opening up the engine compartment is actually pretty simple because the, the back deck is all of maybe four to five millimeters thick if that. So even I, in my older, weaker state, can still get this thing open on my own. If you look in the engine bay, you're gonna see obviously it is split asymmetrically. On the right hand side is a Scania 1.6 liter uh, six cylinder inline water cooled engine puts out 144 to 160 horsepower depending on which figures you want to use. On the left hand side you're going to see the air filter system, fuel tank and I presume that's the cooling tank. Uh, the radiators are further forward, the fan is at the back. So air comes in presumably at the front, gets sucked through the radiators and then out the engine compartment at the back. Now also in common with uh, some of the other Landsworks we saw, you'll see that there are holes at the top for the airflow, which actually passes through the lid. So in order to get the air, it's actually kind of clever, in order to get the air from one side of the engine bay toward the other side of the engine bay without having to make the engine bay really big in order to have extra piping uh, under the deck, uh, what they've done is they've simply turned the deck into part of the airflow system. So under here, it's a little bit hollow. It's got maybe an inch, inch and a half of thickness. So the air comes in through the intakes here, uh, which is already relatively clean because it's coming from the top. And uh, you know, so not too much dust is getting into the system to start with, into the engine bay gets sucked in through the two air filters, comes out the top into the engine deck, across the engine deck to the far side, and then into the intake on the far side by the engine. And of course the exhaust comes out the back and uh, you saw it earlier, comes under the side. So it's a rather clever little system, but as you can see, not the most space efficient. Of course there's advantages and disadvantages to the big gap in the middle. Uh, one of the advantages is it's actually kind of easy to work on this vehicle. The disadvantage, of course, is this is wasted space. So when you were designing a vehicle, ideally you want to have as little wasted space as possible because that's space you don't need to cover with armor. Uh, but as an anti-aircraft vehicle, this is a little bit less critical, so no harm done. And the power shaft, of course, will go forward into the uh, gearbox and uh, then the uh, transmission. Uh, gearbox and then the differential, forgive me, and uh, we'll have a look at that in a few minutes. So there you go, that is the inside of the engine bay of the Anti-2. Finally, as I'm closing this up, I'll just quickly observe that there actually is a stand. So if all you're doing is just some lightweight stuff, like uh, let's say fill in the fuel tanks, you can mount the engine deck on the stand and it gives you perfect access to the fuel tanks, the cooling system or anything else you need to access without going all the way forward. Although if I did that, it's completely dark in here now and you wouldn't have been able to see anything. And I'll just secure it and we'll move inside. So after I closed the engine deck, of course I realized I screwed up uh, because it revealed the uh, two access ports for the coolant. So coolant goes in there and the big black tank that was on the left hand side is actually engine oil. 
at least I presume it is, because it's the only thing that's left that I can think of. Uh, the other item of note is this on the back of the turret. Now, ordinarily, the 40 millimeter of fours ejects at the front. And if you see these things firing, it's quite impressive. I mean, they, there's a, a very sharp corner, and it still has enough velocity to go flying off at great velocity to the front. But in an armored vehicle, you can't do that. Uh, a, you never know what's in front of you, uh, like the driver's head. And B, well, that would make the turret really, really high. Because if you look at the ejection chute on the ground mount, you'll see it's most of a meter below the gun barrel. Well, you can't put most of a meter below the gun barrel because if you have this as a horizontal mount, let's say shooting ground targets, light armor, which was pretty good at, the, the anti-1 was basically the Nimrod, uh, which was used in a dual mode anti-ground, uh, anti-armor and anti-air mode. Um, if you wanted to have room both for the notch for the gun depression for the gun and for ejections uh, to come out the front of the turret at any angle, well, the, the turret will be stupidly high. So instead, what they've done is they've reversed the direction of the ejection. So instead of the round coming back and then being cycled downwards, the chute is reversed, the round comes back, cycles upwards, you'll see inside, and then in the immortal words of Ian, goes zwee! the back and well that makes a lot more sense so I'll start on the left hand side of the turret the elevation gunner and the gun is currently in the travel lock position he has a large lever here which connects to the lock releases on the right hand side so just release the lock pull back and up it comes it's a lot easier to go down I just go on its own almost, then up, but up is not too bad, it's, it's not too heavy. You lean forward a little bit to get to the side because of my height, but no matter. Uh, they will note that there are two sites on the vehicle, one for the elevation and one for the traverse. Each site is a reflector site, it also has a push to lift up, a push and twist to lift up, Filter, if it's a little bit too sunny, you got to uh, factor with your sunglasses, dim it down a bit so you're not blinding yourself as you're looking through, just in case the enemy is coming at you from the sun. And there is a backup, a very basic wire backup site on the left-hand side. Now, on the ground mount version, and this is uh, a plug, I guess, to, to go look at my video on the ground mount version of the 40 millimeter. Uh, the left side gunner does have uh, firing pedals. Well, the anti-2 was operated by firing pedal, but the control was actually on the right-hand side. It's a little bit more complicated than the ground mount in terms of the fire control system. Unfortunately, uh, it's uh, not on this vehicle, so I can't show you. But the actual control, so under the cover here, is going to be the same feed chute, and you've got the same levers and safety catches on the left-hand side. Again, go look at my video on the four centimeter befores, and you'll be fine. This one, made 1938, number 15, it says. 550 kilograms with the befores mount uh, marking. Uh, there are connectors, uh, electrical connectors, apparently for an intercom system, eventually got added. And you can also see the rollers that the turret mounts on. So usually you, you don't get to see the roller bearings of a turret, but in this case, it's mounted on rollers that are scattered around and they run on this turret race. Uh, so that's about it for the gunner side, obviously a couple of pouches. You'll see uh, forward as it depresses, it, they have a cutout slot, uh, and it's a much smaller cutout slot at a low angle of elevation. The reason for this is if you're engaging an aircraft at this angle, you're probably going to be a little bit offset. It's going to be harder for you to be directly lined up on the aircraft as you're firing at it. Uh, so you need to have a larger cutout in the armor in order to have a better chance of spotting the target to aim at it. However, the further down you go, all of a sudden, you're now looking at ground targets. And a ground target doesn't move anywhere near as fast. So what they've done is they've just put a very narrow slit, just wide enough for the optic, uh, and that way it reduces the amount of bullets that are coming at you. It's a smaller hole for the enemy to shoot at in order to hit the gunner. 
So that's why you see that. So I'll bring this back up again. And of course, being the befores all the way up, I'll try not to hit the ceiling. That's about as far as I want it to go because there's an overhead strut, so I'm gonna leave that alone. And down we come again. So I will leave that alone. And the basket, as I said, because they've made the turret wings so much wider, uh, the basket or the platform, it's plenty, uh, plenty comfortable enough. Even with my long legs, I can, I can maneuver the gun without too much trouble. So uh, that said, let's hop over onto the other side and we'll have a look, see what's there. Left-hand side, it's, uh, I don't know, it almost feels a little bit more cramped. I mean, the seat is only an inch or two off the ground anyway. Uh, but the traverse controller, so both people have to aim together in order to hit the target. Um, exactly the same idea, they've wired it shut and uh, they've wired a lot of these things shut, which is why I haven't opened a lot of them. Uh, but two points to note. First, there's not very much ammo stowed in here that I can see. Now that's not to say that there wasn't going to be a lot, because obviously an automatic gun you're going to fire a lot. I do see uh, room for three four round clips directly behind me here. Obviously more would be scattered around almost certainly on the turret walls here. You see these mounting points, uh, or what I presume would be mounting points are scattered around. And if there's more underneath the turret floor, perhaps I will have a look later. Now, the, one of the differences between this and the ground mount is that you have the gun commander in the back with a ballistic computer or fire control computer, whatever you want to call it. And it has a couple of functions, so this would appear to be a, a gross range uh, adjuster, so you can see how the elevation or the super elevation is changed. The gun, the commander would have probably, he'd be holding it a bit like a, uh, a tiller because you can modify this left and right to adjust for lead. And there's a, a little uh, indicator here. Then you can make fine adjustments, which show on the front here for what, whatever it is, I'm not sure. Well, obviously this one is for elevation. I would assume this is for lead of some sort. And you can also do some bore sighting. So this would be bore sighting in elevation and this in traverse. So as I say, this was pedal operated. The, there is a cable that comes to the right hand side. The pedal will be located on the right. And you would need the team of three people in order to engage the target. So you've got your gun commander with a ballistic computer. You've got the traverse and you've got the elevation. All three of them have to be working together. But when it works, apparently it worked very well. Uh, the, I believe the six vehicles got 11 kills between them which doesn't sound like much until you realize just how hard it was to shoot down anything in World War II with a single cannon. Uh, let's see, not much else I can say. Looks like more ammo stowage forward. And well, let's have a look at the driver's hole. Well, my slide into the driver's hole was not particularly elegant, not least because I'm trying to keep my trousers clean. Uh, but they really could be a lot worse. It's not as bad as all that. Uh, again, if you recall from my video on the Landsverks, I was very impressed as to how roomy they were, especially given their age and size. It was kind of one of the best creature comfort designed into war tanks. And this is pretty similar, all things considered. I mean, I can drive this. Uh, my left foot on what I presume is clutch, right foot on the accelerator, and I still have room for the two brake levers. Uh, which are kind of spring-loaded, actually. You get to about this this far, and then all of a sudden, the rest of the way forwards. Um, but as I say, this isn't bad. I have vision at the right, right front, two straight front, and another two on the left. Now, in, in fairness, these two are kind of blocked. But I suspect that's because there's a shutter. Aha! There is indeed a shutter. Well, in this case, a removable sight block. Yep. 
You can see the, the notches here for the sight block. You hold it in place. Uh, so it has to be screwed out, it looks like. There we go. Yeah, screw that back in. So that's a neat feature. Yeah, it looks like looks like all the sight blocks are removable. Uh, but yeah, there are ballistic shields covering the ones on the on the far sides. And let's see, what's this one control? Oh, this is the hatch release back here for the driver's hatch as it opens up. Um, yeah, so let me close it all the way. Okay, driver's hatch is now completely closed. Um, in terms of gauges and instruments, there's not much. Water temperature, oil, I, I presume temperature goes, oh no, pounds per, pounds? It says LB. No, L8, L8, L8 zero degrees. So and I guess that's oil, pressure, uh, oil temperature. Uh, so this is oil pressure. Benson is gonna be fuel. I noticed in both uh, Finnish and Sp uh, Swedish, because of course it's a uh, dual language country. Now, rather helpfully, uh, because again, this is an operating vehicle, they have scrawled the shift pattern on the right hand side here. So reverse is all, oh, let me push down here. The cross drive shaft kind of gets in the way. So reverse is all the way down and forward then come back up a little bit into first, is, is here somewhere. Can't get into it. Can't seem to get into second either. And there's a lockout to get into fourth and fifth. Well, it could be that you can only really get into it when the vehicle's in motion, so I'm gonna leave that alone. Uh, a couple of fuses. Handles, I'm not actually sure what they're for. The gearbox, of course, is underneath, so because they have one outside on display, I will now put an inset so you can see what the gearbox actually looks like. And well, the seat itself, or does it adjust? I believe the seat adjusts. Well, let's see what happens if I try this. Ah, I go into an even more lower position. So this is an angle on the seat. So the front of the seat has stayed still and the back has simply come down. So I can tilt forward if I have to. No indication that the seat will slide forwards or backwards. There is a small backrest here. It's got the same mount as on the Landsberg. You recall that the, the seat will detach on the, on the Landsberg and uh, so you get out of the way so you can move back into the turret. Well, obviously there is no particular need for it on this vehicle because you can get into the turret the old way, you, you go up. Yet they just kept the same uh, backrest mount. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Okay, well, that's pretty much it for the Landsberg. Again, good job, Sweden. And now for two reasons, I've got to get out of here, is A, there's a tour group coming through, I'm not going to be able to record for the next half hour anyway, so I need to turn off the camera to save the battery, and B, because it is an excuse to say, oh bugger, the tank's on fire. That was easy. Let's undo the little locking latch here. Bring it closed, don't want the rain to get in or anything. Something I noticed as I was opening it. This latch here that you push forward to release the lock on the inside, you must pull, pull it back up before it hits on the interior side here, otherwise your hatch will get stuck. So you can't use it to push and keep pushing. You gotta unlock it, touch forward a bit and then keep pushing. Just in case you ever have to get out of an L62 in a hurry. You never know when that sort of information comes in useful. So there you go, a vehicle most of you probably never heard of.
I'm, I must count myself in that because when I asked the director of the museum here, hey, what vehicle do you have that you really want to show off? He said, the Anti-2. Hey, what the hell's an Anti-2? Well, now you know, now I know. Again, they built six of them. They did see service throughout the end of World War II or the Continuation War, as Finland calls it. And the Battery of Six did shoot down 11 aircraft. This specific vehicle, and they were able to track them because there's only six of them to track, and their uh, serial numbers are actually uh, etched and welded onto the side, uh, is known to have shot down one aircraft by uh, hitting the pilot in the head with a 40 millimeter round. So boom, headshot, and down it went. And it went off to check off the remains afterwards. The vehicles remained in frontline service uh, as this one single armored battery until 1957. Uh, at that point, uh, they stopped training the conscripts on the vehicles and uh, they were moved to a more reserve function around air bases. So there became a, an air base defense system, probably as near to static as makes no difference, but anyway. And they remained in that service until 1966. So there you go. Thank you to the Patreons for helping fund the tour to get me here and to the Parola Panseri Museo. I have, forgive me if I butchered that, uh, that word. It, uh, again, Finnish is not exactly a native tongue of mine. Uh, but anyway, to, to get here, you, you land at Helsinki, you drive north for about an hour, hour and a bit, and it's not too hard to get to. All right, hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll talk to you on the next one. Okay, so I come in the right hand side, uh, the uh, Traverse Gun. Oh, great, really? I didn't bring that many pairs of jeans. Three, two.